from Australian Community Futures Planning on the State of Australia in 2020. I'm Bronwyn Kelly, the founder of ACFP, and this series covers the facts about the health and well-being of Australia's society, environment, economy and democracy. The issues listed here are among the most important for Australia to solve before 2030. Failure to make substantial progress on these issues in the coming decade will make it harder and far more costly for Australians to arrive safely in 2050 with an acceptable degree of well-being and security. Australian Community Futures Planning is working with Australians to develop a plan to overcome the challenging issues raised in this series. That plan is called Australia Together. This is Australia's first National Community Futures Plan. It is being developed by Australians for Australians and is designed to increase our chances of arriving safely at our preferred future by 2050 or sooner. Factual details and data presented in this series provide the starting points for Australia Together. They pinpoint some of our biggest weaknesses as a nation in 2020. As such, they form the basis for some of the most ambitious targets that Australians can draft into their first National Community Futures Plan. The full set of seven video casts on the State of Australia in 2020 covers facts about our nation's health and well-being in 20 critical areas of our society, environment, economy and democracy. This episode comes in three interrelated parts. Part one covered issue number nine on the growth of unethical governance in Australia. Part two covered issue 10 on fractious international relations. And part three covers issue 11 on corporate irresponsibility. You can pause this video at any time to consider the points and statistics provided. For the remaining episodes in the State of Australia in 2020, visit the ACFP website at www.austcfp.com.au. In Australia in 2020, the standard of corporate responsibility is a bit of a mixed bag. At one extreme, we have the mining industry and fossil fuel companies with few, if any, credentials to corporate responsibility. Their track record of environmental and heritage devastation in things like tailing stand collapses, wetland destruction and waterway pollution, oil spills and destruction of ancient Aboriginal heritage sites, particularly in Western Australia, displays how out of step these companies really are with modern standards for responsible and ethical participation in business. And this is before we get to issues like their failure to pay tax, their failure to share profits with taxpayers who subsidise them, their failure to pay to restore the environments they destroy, and their failure to respect the need to eliminate carbon emissions. Other businesses, outside mining and fossil fuels, display varying degrees of responsibility and performance in relation to climate change, environmental regulations, workers' rights, human rights and ethical governance. A few are set up to be green and ethical and they are growing in number daily. Our biggest banks support all these businesses, ethical and unethical, pretty much regardless of their records on ethical and environmental parameters. Australia's big four banks, ANZ, Commonwealth, National and Westpac, have shown little sign of genuine commitment to ethical investment. As the independent ethical investment watchdog Market Forces has reported, between 2016 and 2020, Australia's big four banks invested more than three times as much in fossil fuels as they did in renewables. And by that, they enabled 13.9 billion tonnes of CO2 to be emitted to the atmosphere. The world and Australia do not need this. On the contrary, we need to write off existing fossil fuel investments and reduce, not increase, carbon emissions. We need to take the hit for those past bad investments now before they get much worse. 
But since Australia signed on to the Paris Agreement in 2015, and at least outwardly agreed to do everything necessary to prevent the Earth from heating by more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, these big banks and some others, such as Macquarie Bank, have dragged Australia's economy and investors far deeper into future massive financial losses via their expanded investment in fossil fuels. These are investments that simply do not have a future long enough to enable the banks to get their, and our, money back. This is a betrayal of Australia on both environmental and financial measures. What we have to imagine here is a big future loss for the banking sector and yet another taxpayer bailout for that sector. And this time, for much more than Australians had to shoulder during the global financial crisis. There really should be laws against this, but there aren't. And because there aren't, the big four banks have provided finance for 33 new or expanded fossil fuel projects since committing to support the Paris Agreement. Over their lifetimes, these projects are expected to enable the release of an additional 9 billion tonnes of CO2. This is enough to cancel out Australia's planned reduction in emissions between 2021 and 2030. According to market forces, it's enough to cancel it out 21 times over. And yet the banks show next to no intention of stopping this behaviour. As at late 2020, they have no published intention to phase out fossil fuel exposure in line with the Paris Agreement, or rule out funding for new or expansionary projects, or even rule out investing in companies whose business plan would lead to failure under the Paris Agreement. There is barely a shred of ethics here. And if ethics are not present in the sector that is providing the capital for our future economy, we can be certain that far too much of the business sector itself is still prepared to run Australia up against the rocks for the sake of short-term private profits. The split in consciousness and conscience about corporate responsibility and ethics can be understood as an ideological divide. Australia and Australians are stuck in the middle of a clash between two different approaches to business. One of these is exemplified by the policies and plans for Australia put forward by the Business Council of Australia in their release in 2019 of what they have called a plan for a stronger Australia. This plan clings to a business first approach as though only business can save Australia. In opposition to that, we have plans put forward by the Australian National Outlook 2019, a group of Australian businesses, non-profit organisations, universities and professionals, led by the CSIRO and, somewhat ironically given their funding of fossil fuels, the National Australia Bank. These two plans are chalk and cheese, even though they're both put forward with the involvement of big business, big finance and big fossil fuels. The difference in the case of the Australian National Outlook is that it involves universities, charitable NGOs and professionals from both the private and government trading enterprise sectors. They have collaborated to produce a plan that demonstrably takes the national interest into account first and foremost. And this has shaved off the excesses of the participants in business that we know can otherwise behave less altruistically, like the National Australia Bank, and the other participant in the outlook, Shell Oil. By contrast, the BCA's plan moderates no such excesses. It unashamedly considers that the national interest, and workers' interest for that matter, cannot be served at all unless the interests of business owners are served first. The BCA's plan for a stronger Australia is based on neoliberalism. It is a plan that assumes businesses should be supported by government rather than be competitive in their own right. And to ensure that any of its losses can be socialised, meaning that society can pay for its losses, it proposes the accumulation of government surpluses and abstemiousness by the government sector in spending on services for ordinary Australians. Specifically, it calls for continued subsidies from Australians and protection of industries that are becoming uncompetitive due to climate change or globalisation or outdated technology and equipment. It also calls for income and company tax reductions 
and a cap on the total amount of taxation revenue that may be collected by the government relative to GDP. And it calls for caps on government spending. In other words, it calls for austerity in public services. In essence, the BCA prefers revenue from taxation to be spent on and by private sector businesses. It does not prefer revenue from taxation to be spent by taxpayers on taxpayers. And it promotes taxpayer spending on taxpayers as inherently inefficient. The message is that private sector business owners are better at using our money and labour efficiently, something which we have seen in episode two of this series is quite unlikely to be true. The BCA plan also seeks government support for buyouts of public assets. Sometimes they even want us to lend them the money to buy our assets. It also seeks labour market deregulation, which reduces conditions and wages for Australians. And it seeks deletion of legislated increases to the superannuation guarantee, easing of airport noise regulations, easing of environmental regulations and elimination of bans on gas exploration. By contrast, the Australian National Outlook Plan focuses heavily on the need for social inclusion, environmental conservation, emissions reduction, education, restoration of trust in governance, cooperative research and cooperative international relations. It models detailed strategies to achieve these things, whereas the BCA plan hardly mentions things social and environmental at all and makes no genuine commitment to education unless it is funded by students themselves through any private debt the students may be willing to take on. In the Australian National Outlook, there is no focus on tax cuts, reduced government spending, subsidies, protectionism or environmental exploitation. And perhaps most notably, it puts forward strategies that will raise wages. By contrast, the BCA simply expects that workers should fund their own wage rises, meaning that if workers want increases in their take-home pay, they should fund that themselves via tax cuts and cuts to legislated increases in their superannuation. The BCA offers no strategy at all that will fund wage rises through, say, profit sharing, through investment of profits in research and development, or through investment in new private capital unless, of course, it is underwritten as much as possible by the taxpayer. The assumptions underpinning all this, as stated outright by the BCA, are that governments must seek to create the environment where Australians can succeed because employers are doing well. But the trouble with this is that the actions the Business Council of Australia prefers to outline, all of which are straight down the line neoliberalism, do not improve the lives of Australians. We are not succeeding in gaining wage improvements. Benefits are not trickling down to workers. Prices for public services that have been privatised are not dropping. In some cases, they've been rising excessively, such as in energy. We can't afford much in the way of higher education anymore. Lower tax rates for the rich and businesses are not translating to investment by business nor are lower taxes for the rich translating to job creation or higher income for the poor. These policies are instead stoking the growth of inequality. In fact, the objective of this sort of plan, a hard-line neoliberal plan, can only be and is inequality. And to top it all off, the economy is not growing as well as it did before neoliberalism hit Australia big time in 2014. And it is not growing as well as it did when government played a bigger role both as a total contributor to the economy and as a competitor to the private sector. The BCA has been implementing its neoliberal plans for Australia for over 20 years but has ramped up its efforts since 2014. And this is the result, a wrecked economy. If viewers wish to see more detail on how neoliberalism has contributed to our economic decline, they might view episode five in this series. This provides more data on how Australia's economy has been in decline since 2014 and was in a poor state before the onset of COVID-19, courtesy of neoliberalism. <laughs>
The BCA could have thought about a plan for a stronger Australia from the opposite angle. They could have said, the actions that will improve our lives require creating the environment where businesses can do well because all Australians have an equal opportunity to succeed. But that alternative mindset was not on offer in their so-called plan for a stronger Australia. A partnership of equals is not preferred by the BCA. The words partnership, joint and cooperation feature not at all in their plan, at least not in the context of employer-worker relationships. And words such as social, society, carbon, emissions, climate and environment hardly read a mention, the implication being that the BCA simply isn't focused on the things concerning large numbers of Australians and has no sense of Australians as anything other than a resource to be exploited. More lately, the BCA and some other peak business groups have rediscovered a little bit of corporate responsibility and have swung behind support for a target of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Some, including the BCA, have even swung around to some support for reintroduction of a carbon price, something they rejoiced in dismantling in 2014. And in recognition of the importance of stimulating demand in the economy for private sector goods and services, the BCA has also joined in the call for an increase in unemployment benefits. Moderations of its neoliberal focus do occur sometimes when it suits them. Generally, when big businesses stop herding along inward-looking ideological lines, they can be persuaded to temper their entrenched prejudices about workers and greenies somewhat, or at least outwardly. The BCA has shown that it can shave off bits of its neoliberalism when it melds in with environmentalists in forums like the Australian Climate Roundtable. The Australian National Outlook can shave off the influence of fossil fuel producer member Shell Oil by drawing it into an approach focused more on the national interest. But there is a long way to go before the BCA, as the peak employer organisation in Australia, develops a genuine outward-looking cooperative approach to nation building, to worker involvement in workplace bargaining and to employee representation on company boards. There is certainly a long way to go before the BCA will welcome the current trend of their diminishing control of corporate boards due to the growing influence and shareholdings of members of industry superannuation funds. At the end of 2020, big business groups are lobbying in herds wherever they can to stop the implementation of legislated increases to the superannuation guarantee. Increases that are due to grow by increments of half a percent per annum between 2021 and 2025, providing a total of a 2.5% income increase to workers over the next five years. Businesses are arguing this can't be afforded and that the increases will detract from wage rises that may otherwise accrue. They were arguing this before COVID-19. This obviously specious argument is that Australians need this money in their pockets now and will not need it when they retire. This is nothing more than a plea to Australians that not only should they continue to suffer the low wage increases forced on them over the years from 2014, while company profits rose dramatically, they should expect to forego tiny superannuation increases too. Having become accustomed to not having to share its high profits with workers in wage rises in the past half dozen years, big business clearly wants to keep that pattern in place. Of course, the reality is that Australia has not reached a point where a mere 0.5% superannuation increase can't be afforded in a year, pandemics notwithstanding. As a nation, we still generate a high ratio of wealth per capita, and our system depends on sharing this around. The real concern, from the big business perspective, is not about the affordability of the superannuation increase. It is about their fear that the increasing investment power of ordinary Australians via their superannuation, a power which has now ballooned out to almost $3 trillion, will swamp the power of the tiny few who have hitherto enjoyed total control of corporate boards. The argument that Australians do not need their superannuation increases 
is about shoring up elite corporate powers. And it is especially about the fear by corporations that they will be forced to act and invest ethically when it might not suit them. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison has obviously heard this plea from the corporate powers and has responded by vowing to introduce legislation to outlaw boycotts by Australians of companies we might personally believe to be acting in an unethical or environmentally damaging way. He came out in late 2019 and stated peremptorily that, together with the Attorney General Christian Porter, we are working to identify serious mechanisms that can successfully outlaw these indulgent and selfish boycott practices that threaten the livelihoods of fellow Australians. He meant we should outlaw protests where one Australian merely encourages another not to invest in or supply to industries that pose unacceptable environmental threats and losses. It was an endorsement of suppression of free speech and free choice, suppression of the rights of Australians to decide where they will spend their money, and even suppression of the free market that he would otherwise have habitually endorsed as the most efficient hand of wealth generation. What this indicates is that the authority to determine what is and isn't responsible in corporate behaviour isn't going to be ceded by big business to ordinary Australians without a fight. There is an objective within neoliberalism that equality on that scale should not be realised, especially not by means of employer-funded superannuation increases. Running in parallel with that sort of corporate power play and reinforcing it is a partnership between the Conservative Federal Government since 2014 and the Murdoch media. This partnership has been operating in an anti-competitive way to gradually disable the taxpayer-owned ABC and reduce whatever competition it may pose to Murdoch. It has also operated very effectively to disable the open market design of Australia's national broadband network, with the coalition government abandoning the original NBN design of fibre optic cable to homes in 2014 and replacing it with mixed cables to nodes remote from homes. This meant that households would have to pay extra to connect to the NBN and also that it would be slower than the original design. And this introduced an extra barrier to entry for competitors to Murdoch, such as Netflix. Because of the conversion of the design into cable to the node, Murdoch was able to protect the dominance of his Foxtel cable network in Australia. Both of these power plays, the budget reductions for the ABC and the budget reductions for the lower service design of the NBN, were strongly anti-competitive moves in Murdoch's favour. They have left Australia with a singularly unsatisfactory NBN in which it has been hard to keep even a basic phone call from cutting out and an ABC that is unable to retain programs we have valued for decades. At least 1,000 Australians have needlessly lost their jobs at the ABC because of this. The Coalition Government came to power in 2013 promising not to make cuts to the ABC, but then proceeded relentlessly down a path of funding reductions until by 2020 the ABC had lost $783 million from its funding. The government has stated that the ABC's funding has not decreased, but their budget papers clearly demonstrate that funding has indeed declined in real terms, meaning the ABC budget hasn't kept pace with the increasing cost of service delivery. Far from it. Other financially harmful steps have also been taken, including the removal of contracts for the ABC with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and the privatisation of the ABC's transmission network in 1999. The fact is, the ABC is being slowly defunded. How do we know? We can easily observe the programming and job losses. Anything else is simply accounting semantics, trotted out for obfuscation purposes by a faithless government. It might be different if Australians wanted to spend less of their money on the ABC, but that is not what taxpayers want. Nowhere do we see evidence cited that Australians want a smaller, less capable ABC.
On the contrary, when faced with the option of cuts for the ABC, Australians respond in the vast majority that it should have the same or more funding. And if there is a choice to be made about who to trust to deliver accurate news, it certainly isn't the view of Australians that the Murdoch press is to be trusted. Murdoch barely rates above social media on trustworthiness. On any poll, such as the 2019 Roy Morgan poll, which found that only 7% of Australians distrust the ABC, or the 2020 Queensland University of Technology poll, in which Australians clearly place the ABC at the top of the trust scale. On any of these and similar polls, the ABC consistently comes out as the most trusted media outlet in Australia by far. We're not talking about a small trust gap here. Results of all these surveys are an indictment of coalition decisions to defund the ABC. They're simply an insult to taxpayers. On any reckoning, there are absolutely no grounds to believe that Australians want funding to the ABC to be reduced. There are certainly no grounds to conclude that they want taxpayer funds to go towards propping up Murdoch. This, however, did not stop the coalition government handing over $40 million of taxpayers' funds as grants to Murdoch between 2017 and 2020, even as, in the same three-year period, it was reducing the ABC funding by $432 million. That this sort of thing should be happening in Australia when concentration of media ownership is also growing is a serious concern. Australia has a very high concentration of media ownership compared to other Western countries. Basically, there is very little competition, particularly in news media, with Murdoch largely dominating the print news market and controlling around 60 to 70% of the daily newspaper sales. Nine controls another large section of the news market, having been given permission to buy Fairfax in 2018, a reprehensible decision which has significantly reduced media diversity in Australia. In Queensland, Murdoch owns all but one of the regional newspapers, although in several regional areas, he has been buying them and shutting them down. That's another blow for media diversity. The problem of too much media concentration has been recognised by hundreds of thousands of Australians, over 500,000 of whom signed a petition to Parliament in late 2020, launched by former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd for a Royal Commission into Murdoch, who Mr Rudd claimed was a cancer on democracy. The petition was signed by Conservative former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and resulted in the establishment of a Senate inquiry into media diversity, or lack of it, in Australia. Everyone from all sides of politics seems to agree that Australia's level of media concentration is not good for democracy and needs to be reviewed. Unfortunately, in 2020, this problem of market concentration in our news media is being made worse by the federal government's insistence on the introduction of a compulsory News Media Bargaining Code. This is a highly exclusive, anti-competitive move by Australia's government, very much in Murdoch's favour. At the direction of the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, it's being introduced by the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, the ACCC, and has been clumsily disguised as an admittedly unusual but justifiable interference in free market trading negotiations ostensibly in order to save a public benefit that is at least theoretically provided in Australia by independent news media. That benefit being apparently a well-functioning democracy. It's probable that no one would dispute that open democracies rely heavily on independent news media. But the code as first drafted was not designed to save the only news organisations we have in Australia that might be considered independent, inasmuch as they can't be bought by advertisers. It wasn't designed to save the ABC or some other outlets that run largely or wholly independent of advertising such as The Conversation. Instead, the primary intention of the code was to save essentially non-independent, for-profit news businesses in the private sector, those enthralled to and dependent on advertisers.
The government didn't ask itself whether continued and boosted dependence on advertising was a good thing for maintenance of independent public interest journalism. It just decided to enforce a code that would reattach journalism to advertising dependency. In late 2020, the government amended its exposure draft of the News Media Bargaining Code to make it slightly less anti-competitive to Google and Facebook, but the code will still have the effect of increasing the excessive market power of Murdoch and Nine instead of reining it in. It functions to force the efficient information market players, Google and Facebook, to prop up their inefficient, poorly run commercial competitors, which has to be a first of its kind in free market interventions. And it does this without raising the standards for quality in journalism. Australians are justifiably critical of the quality of some of the information that is circulated on Facebook and Google. But they will be no better off with a code that simply forces Google and Facebook to subsidise the production of misinformation frequently circulated by the Murdoch media and increasingly by nine. The ACCC has asserted that the extraordinarily disproportionate market intervention that is the News Media Bargaining Code is necessary to correct an ostensible, but not proven, bargaining power imbalance held by Google and Facebook over Murdoch and Nine. This is an assertion that even conservative Liberal Party politicians found laughable in their review of the ACCC's code. They rightly questioned the whole idea that there is a power imbalance between Google and Facebook on one hand and the news media businesses on the other, but stated that it had become clear that the code would be imposed in spite of that, simply because that's what the PM wants. Clearly, the PM is in thrall to Murdoch. The reality is that Murdoch and Nine's market concentration in print, TV and radio has given them extraordinary political power. And this is the real power imbalance that is adversely impacting our democracy. Murdoch and Nye now enjoy a level of political power that is presenting a serious threat to Australia's democracy and the code will allow them to expand this with no corresponding offset benefit in the form of better quality public interest journalism or better control of misinformation. The code is being marketed as the saviour of small players in public interest journalism businesses. But the reality is that it significantly increases help for the two big players, Murdoch and Nine, and can at the absolute best only minimally increase the large amount of help already being provided by Google and Facebook to new, smaller, diverse news outlets. Digital platforms have increased the competitive capacity of small news outlets against the big ones simply by making new business models available to new entrants that are far more cost efficient for creation and delivery of news. Murdoch and Nine are attempting to stamp out these new entrants and the News Media Bargaining Code will help them. It will consolidate the dominance of the two big news businesses. For more information on this, viewers may watch the video submission from Australian Community Futures Planning to the Senate Inquiry into Media Diversity you can watch this on our website at www.austcfp.com.au forward slash news or just Google ACFP submission to the Senate Inquiry into Media Diversity in Australia. You can also read our full written submission on the ACFP website. In a nutshell, ACFP has suggested just two straightforward reforms for protection of our democracy in the digital age. We've suggested that the News Media Bargaining Code be scrapped in its entirety and replaced with establishment of a national community engagement process of collaborative planning for an ethical and fair 21st century democratic information market and introduction of legislation to prohibit greater market concentration via cross-media or cross-platform takeovers. The ACCC has conducted a long inquiry into the digital platforms and has emerged suggesting 
that it is the digital giants, Google and Facebook, that are threatening journalism and therefore democracy. But the reality is that digital platforms are not strangling journalism. They're doing the opposite. Diverse journalism is supported, not destroyed, by the digital platforms. And the plain fact is that Murdoch and Nine simply don't like this competition and have succeeded in stripping the ACCC's inquiry of its independence. They are also making ground in their fight to strip their main competitor, the ABC, of its independence in editorial terms and its competitiveness in terms of adequate funding. The unprecedented grip of the two big news media businesses in Australia on our democracy is the triumph of Murdoch's corporate irresponsibility. It's turning our democracy into a plutocracy. We are being run by unelected fossil fuel, banking and media magnates and they do not have a care for the nation's best interests. Legislation is being introduced to make the banking sector less responsible, especially when they run for-profit retail superannuation funds. Other legislation is being amended to increase subsidies for fossil fuel businesses. And, of course, the news sector is being handed a massive market advantage by the News Media Bargaining Code. It's difficult to impossible to think of a time when the power of certain parts of Australia's corporate sector has been exercised as irresponsibly as it is being exercised in 2020, without restraint in decent regulation. The whole relationship between government and these big corporate players in fossil fuels, finance and news media can only be described as highly unethical. And that's putting it politely. The current federal government under Scott Morrison has not proved its credentials in independent regulation of corporate entities who seek market dominance. On the contrary, it has proved only that it is deeply susceptible to crony capitalism. With the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, the only moves we have seen from the federal government on corporate sector regulation seem to have been to remove it. The most egregious example of this is the Federal Treasurer Josh Frydenberg's amendments of regulations in mid-2020 that effectively release private companies from legal obligations to keep markets and investors informed of their financial standing. In other words, he has released private businesses from having to disclose whether they are heading into or trading in insolvency. His stated objective in this is to ensure these failing companies will still be able to attract investment from Australians, particularly from their pooled superannuation funds, even though such investment may not be a safe one at all. The move is openly and unashamedly stated by the Treasurer as one designed to make class actions harder in the event of losses caused to Australians on investments made in good faith by them but courted and accepted by corporations in very bad faith. It really doesn't come much more like crony capitalism than this. As the chief executive of law firm Morris Blackburn has stated, if bad company directors take advantage of this change to lie to shareholders and people whose savings are in superannuation, the nation's treasurer will share responsibility. It might be more accurate to say that the Treasurer intends to evade responsibility, but responsible and culpable he certainly will be. The irresponsibility of this move by the Treasurer has been seen before. It's exactly the same irresponsible regulation of financial institutions and markets that brought about the global financial crisis of 2008. It's the same as the irresponsible regulation that allowed banks, commercial companies, markets and ratings agencies like Moody's and Standard & Poor's to mislead investors into unsafe investments that resulted in the GFC. The apparent lack of shame about the Frydenberg announcement and others he has made since then which attempt to loosen controls on responsible lending strongly suggests that standards of corporate responsibility are likely to be weighted more to the irresponsible side for some time to come. As things stand, there being little evidence that leadership within government is promoting corporate responsibility and ethics, and quite a lot of evidence that corporate power, particularly anti-competitive market power, is not being constrained by the government, the mixed bag 
that is Australia's standard of corporate responsibility is a recipe for ongoing instability in the economy. Investors beware. Keep a good grip on your superannuation and be very careful to ensure it is invested safely and ethically. That's the only way you can be assured of positive returns. The next episode of the State of Australia in 2020 looks at how our economy is being impacted by the things I've discussed in this episode and by other significant limitations. It covers how our economy is on the brink of a transformation, but how we have not yet set ourselves up to ensure that transformation is towards prosperity and away from the path of economic decline we have been on since 2014. There are significant issues standing in the way of Australians who may wish to chart a path to a prosperous future. These issues aren't limited to corporate irresponsibility, immature fractious approaches to international relations or unethical governance, although these things are certainly weakening our economy. The next episode covers other threats, threats arising from our own attitudes about the role of government in economic prosperity, the role of Australians as owners of Australia's resources, and the place of welfare in relation to prosperity. But it also looks at the opportunities. Australians wishing to travel towards a brighter economic future can increase their chances of arriving there by developing a plan not just for our economy but for the society, environment and democracy we need to be able to build that better economy. Australia Together is being developed by Australians to ensure we can integrate our efforts along multiple lines and travel efficiently to a brighter future. You can become involved in developing Australia Together by visiting the ACFP website at www austcfp.com.au and registering for updates. Thanks for watching this episode. For further episodes in this series of the State of Australia in 2020, visit the ACFP website or stay tuned for episode 5 on the decline of Australia's economy, the loss of public ownership of Australian assets and our inertia in transition to a decarbonised economy. If you like this episode, please click like on the YouTube page and share the episode with your friends and subscribe to this channel.